First off, you've made it to the start of our day two. So welcome to the virtual March of Dimes High School Science Week. Once again, my name is Joshua Von Trapp. I come to you from the Salk Institute, where this is a very proud tradition. It's our 31st annual event. We absolutely wish we could have you on campus with us, but we're proud to continue the event in a virtual space. Even so, our Salk researchers look forward to the event and are eager to interact with you throughout the week. Some of you may have already taken advantage of that by submitting a question for our panelists ahead of time. If you haven't, that's OK. I'll show you later on. Where you can do that. Now, Salk is not an acronym. It's named for Dr. Jonas Salk. And you may have heard his name recently in the news as he was a key player in another public health crisis, the polio epidemic in the 40s and 50s. Dr. Salk developed the safe and effective polio vaccine. And from there, he went on to pursue another dream, which is to create a collaborative environment where researchers could explore the basic principles of life. Six years later, the Salk Institute is a world-renowned basic biological research facility. Now our campus was designed by Louis Kahn and completed in 1965 and now designated a historical site. The Institute fulfills the founder, Dr. Jonas Salk's vision of a facility with open, unobstructed laboratory interiors set in a dramatic location that inspires creativity among its researchers. So much inspiration that Salk has had six Nobel laureates in physiology and medicine. 39 biotech companies have been spun off or inspired by Salk Institute discoveries. Over 54 countries are represented by Salk faculty, staff, and students, and over 580 US and foreign patents. I'd say Dr. Salk's vision was fruitful. Now, a quick rundown of what to expect for the virtual lab tour today. The first one, you've already made it. You're here for our introduction and program information with me, Salk Education Outreach. Very shortly, we'll dive into our virtual lab tour. Then we'll have a panel discussion. And at the very end, we'll wrap up with some closing marks and be done by 1.30. Now we hope the event will run smoothly, but if technical issues arise, please be patient and just reach out to education at salk.edu and we'll do our best. Each lab tour is a standalone experience, so you're welcome to attend only those that align with your interests or all the events. We recommend checking out at least a few, as you may be intrigued by a field you've never considered. Each lab tour will have a separate link, and the recordings we made available to registered attendees when they're available. Now, our favorite part of the week is interacting with you. Now, we're curious what you want to know about. So we'll be using student questions to guide our panel discussion. In order to do that, to submit a question for the panel, just click the link in the video description. There, you'll be able to find more information about the lab's research, and you'll be able to take, go, go to the event webpage where you'll find bios for the panelists and moderators, and you can learn more about the lab. And as well, there is another opportunity for you to submit a question to a panelist. Now, a little bit about the high school programs we have. Our first, the Heidoff Brody High School Summer Scholars. Now, this is an eight week program with the first week of a biotech boot camp, and then seven weeks in the lab for a paid internship. It's mentorship by Salk scientists with the opportunity to conduct real life research and develop science communication skills. There's industry visits, seminars, and special events. Now, summer 2021 is to be determined based off public health. So feel free to check our website for program status update in March. You may notice in those pictures, those are some of our previous years. I'd like to highlight just one of those pictures for you. If you look at the bottom left, you'll notice that one of the scientists featured there, Kyle, will also be present in our lab tour video in just a couple of minutes. Even if public health doesn't allow for in-person Hydoff Brody Summer Scholars, we do have a virtual program that is open to freshmen through graduated seniors. That is our Introduction to Research Science and Communication virtual program. Now, this is a five-week professional development opportunity for students, five to 10 hours per week, most of them asynchronously. Program elements include reading a journal article, analyzing data, preparing a scientific presentation, and virtual labs. It's completed with a final capstone project on a topic of your interest. This will be continuing for summer 2021. To find out more, you can go to our website and you'll notice there's a program lottery opt-in that will close March 31st, 2021. Now, I know I've shared a lot of info, so if you have any questions, feel, feel, feel free to reach out to us, education at salk.edu, or explore our website for more information. We also want to give a big 
thank you. Because the March of Dimes High School Science Day is made possible through the generous support of Anne and Neil Blue High School Science Fund. Our sincere thanks to the Blue family and all the supporters, partners, and volunteers that make Salk Education Outreach possible, including the March of Dimes. So today, our virtual lab tour will feature the Systems Neurobiology Laboratory under the direction of Kay Tai. The video will give you a glimpse of what a day in the life of a scientist is like. And each video you'll see this week was designed and filmed by the scientists, and each video is unique to that lab. The video is going to highlight some of the technology and techniques our scientists use, but also introduce you to the people that work there and some potential career options if you'd like to go into the STEM field. So without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce the Systems Neurobiology Laboratory under the direction of KTI's virtual lab tour. neuroscience lab, we're specifically interested in how the activities in the brain affects and underlie behavior. Specifically, we're interested in systems neuroscience, which is a type of neuroscience that looks at how circuits in the brain communicate with each other. These circuits are composed of brain cells called neurons and thus are called neural circuits. We're actually interested in how neural circuits underlie behaviors such as social interaction, motivation for getting a reward, anxiety, depression, and schizophrenia. By understanding how these circuits are organized in the brain and how they strengthen as you learn and move about your everyday life, we can also learn how to change these neural circuits and alter the behavior in a positive way. Thus, understanding how the neural circuits in the brain control different types of behavior allows us to develop treatments for depression and other types of mental illnesses. Sounds like fun. Let's check it out. Here's our lab space where we run many different types of exciting experiments. This is where we can collect data to test the different hypotheses that we have about the brain. There are many different spaces that we have in our lab that can run different types of experiments. Let's see what people are working on. This is our arts and crafts area where we build a lot of custom tools for our experiments. Here is a postdoc in the lab, Kyle. Hey Kyle, what are you working on? Hi Darren, uh, well I'm here in the arts and crafts section and this is where we build a lot of different components necessary for us to run our experiments. We build things like electrodes for recording from neurons, or design and build viral tools with some of our uh, cool DNA stuff, and sometimes we design our own components and then print them out with our fun 3D printer. Let's go see what Lord Cornelius Printing is working on right now. And here's our histology area, where we prepare brain slices for imaging. And this is Matilda, one of our research technicians. Let's see what she's working on. Hey Matilda, what's up? Oh hey Darren, welcome to RNA land. I'm currently running a technique called RNA scope. RNA scope is a technique that allows us to scan for different RNA in brain tissue and see where it's localized in the brain. Right now, for example, I'm seeing for two types of dopamine receptors. These receptors allow for signaling of the chemical molecule dopamine, which is a molecule associated with reward. Through this process, I'm able to progressively label the RNA of these receptors in different colors and later visualize them using this high-resolution microscope. Here, 
Let me show you an example I did a few days ago. In this image, you can see the RNA of different receptors labeled in red and green. And the blue here is just a stain that we use to label the brain cells. That sounds awesome. Thanks so much, Matilda. You're welcome. And this is our patching area, where one of our postdocs, Austin, is currently working. Hey Austin, can you tell us about your project? So, hi there. I'm studying the cellular mechanisms involved in depression. And in order to do that, I use a technique called whole cell patch plant electrophysiology, where we can record the electrical properties of a neuron, which is important for cell-cell communication. We can record voltage or current. And here is an example of neuron, which from which I just recorded. Isn't it beautiful? That's so cool. Thanks, Austin. So once we collect our data, we often have to analyze it using different software tools to test our hypotheses. These analyses can take a lot of computational power, so we get to use some pretty cool looking computers. Let's see what kind of analysis Chris is working on. Chris is a graduate student in our lab. Hey, what's going on? Hey, Darren. I'm analyzing data from a technique called calcium imaging, and we use uh, calcium imaging to measure the activity of, of neurons. And so here we can see our different neurons in a brain region called the central amygdala during social behavior. As neurons become more active and calcium enters the cell, they light up. That's awesome. Thanks, Chris. You're welcome. And that was our lab. There's still so little that we understand about the brain, despite it being a huge part of our bodies, our lives, and our world. By using the different techniques I just showed you, we can dream up a ton of different ways to investigate the brain and what it does. Thanks for watching, and I hope you can visit us in person again one day. Hi, I am Nancy Padilla. I'm a postdoc in the lab, which means I finished a PhD already and now I get to be a neuroscientist in the lab. And I'm originally from Puerto Rico. Canha, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Uh, hi, my name is Canha Patra. I'm a second year PhD student in the lab. I'm actually an electrical engineering student, but my focus has been on machine learning and computational neuroscience. I am originally from New Delhi, India. Chris, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, hi, my name is Christopher Lee. I am a third year neuroscience PhD student, um, and I study social neuroscience. I'm originally from Los Angeles, California. Awesome. Mackenzie. Hi, everyone. I'm Mackenzie Paterino. I'm a research technician in the lab, uh, which means I finished my undergraduate degree and I'll be applying to graduate school uh, next year. And I'm originally from Denver, Colorado. Awesome. Well, thank you for introducing yourselves. We have here a couple of questions from the audience. Um, first one is, what sparked your interest in neuroscience? Uh, I can go first on this one. Yeah. Oh, perfect. Um, so in high school and growing up, I was an athlete. I was uh, I really loved playing sports, and so that was a big role for me. Um, and then in high school, I had the opportunity to write an extended essay on a topic of my choice. So I decided to write about how exercise could be used as a treatment for depression. And after that, it really got me interested in depression and mental health. Um, so then I decided to study neuroscience in college, and here I am now. Amazing. An athlete turned neuroscientist. What about you, Chris? Yeah, well, I've always been interested in science, especially since since middle school. Um, and when I went to college, um, the original intention was I, I wanted to go to, to medical school. And so I was like trying to find like a biology major that that appealed to me. And psychobiology was like one of the majors that was available to us, which is kind of like behavioral neuroscience. 
And I thought that sounded really cool. And so I took psychology courses and I, and I really fell in love with it. Um, but psychology, um, at that time, I think I was more interested in like the mechanisms that kind of explained, you know, the things, how we learned, how we feel and that sort of stuff. And so I took more neuroscience classes in college um, and really fell in love with behavioral neuroscience. Awesome. What about you, Ken, huh? Uh, my trajectory was a little different because I'm an engineering student by training. I really like math and physics in high school. And so that's what I choose, chose in my undergrad. But and like eventually wanted to specialize in artificial intelligence and machine learning. And while I was looking at all the cool stuff that's going on out there and all the latest state of the art uh, developments, I found that there are certain limitations in the current status quo, which is because we have not been inspired enough by the brain. And that's where the link between neuroscience and AI came into for me, because effectively we're trying to replicate the brain to be able to like make machines do the same thing. And that's what got me into neuroscience. And that's why I chose to do pursue this for my PhD. Very cool. It's interesting how we can come to neuroscience from so many different ways. Our next question is a little bit more serious, but equally important. Have you faced any obstacles as you pursued your STEM career? If so, how did you overcome it? And Khan, how do you want to start with that? I think for me, it was, um, again, since as I, as I mentioned earlier, uh, I come from an engineering background. And, and so I've always been invested in healthcare and basically applications in biology. And so there's always been problems on the data collection side especially when I was in India where the resources are scarce and it's very hard to collect data. And so on one end, you had to both be able to collect data and have the money to do that and simultaneously also learn the systems to translate the data into a usable form for your analysis. So that has been a constant um, hurdle for me throughout my undergrad and my all my years of grad school. But the upside of that is that there hasn't been a single day when I haven't learned something new, so. That's true. So you've just tackled the challenges by learning, you know, the things that are gonna help you figure out the technical hurdles, basically. Mm -hmm. Chris, what about you? Yeah, I think one of the biggest obstacles I've faced um, so far in STEM is uh, imposter syndrome. I feel like um, not a lot of people really talk about this, um, but really this like feeling where, um, you know, you you feel like, you know, you're not good enough to be like where you are, or, you know, you got here by luck and that sort of stuff. Um, and I think that that's just been kind of like the biggest like mind block for me. And I think the biggest thing that really helped um, me overcome it and this is like still something that I'm that I'm currently working on is is talking to scientists. I think a lot of scientists feel this way. A lot of scientists um, have experienced this before. Um, and so just kind of like that communication with others, I think has, has really helped. And I, I think nowadays people have been more transparent about that and about other mental health issues. Um, yeah. That's awesome. At which points did you feel the imposter syndrome? Definitely when I first started uh, in graduate school. Um, and also to a certain extent in, in college, um, you know, I mean, everybody around you is like so smart. Everybody knows like so many different things. Um, and I think that was kind of like a big struggle that like, you know, like, oh, maybe I'm not like smart enough to be here. Um, or maybe, you know, I, I you know, I, I need to work harder or, or that sort of stuff. And so, um, again, I think just talking to others really, really helped um, with that. Yeah. The peer mentoring, the power of peer mentoring is, is really high. What about you, Mackenzie? Mackenzie. Um, yeah, this is a really important question. I think for me, um, in the current stage of my life, one of the biggest obstacles I faced was in under my undergrad. Uh, I didn't feel like I had as much preparation for some of the classes I took, especially the more technical classes. Um, and so I ended up getting um, some not great grades in some of my undergrad courses. And a lot of the people around me said, you know, if you want to go to grad school, you need to get a 4.0 GPA. You need to have perfect grades. Um, so I was really worried about trying to pursue graduate school when I had a much lower GPA than some of my peers who are also applying. Um, but I am currently in the application process and I've had some good success. So uh, here to tell you that you, you don't need to have the 4.0 if you want to go to graduate school or if you want to, you know, go to a college somewhere. Uh, you just have to, you know, learn how to ask for help and figure out how to bounce back from those, from those obstacles. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. 
Hey, we have one more question. Um, what are some of your favorite topics to research or teach and why? And maybe we can start with you, Mackenzie. Yeah, so I'm really interested in stress and addiction. Um, so I think post-traumatic stress disorder is really fascinating. Um, it's experienced really highly with addiction. So a lot of patients who have post-traumatic stress disorder also have addiction. So I think that's really interesting to try to um, learn about the link between those two and see if we can uncover what's going wrong and, and what's causing that. And how do you go about learning about this? Um, great question. There's a lot of papers you can read. Um, I, you know, spend a lot of time reading review papers. Um, so I think that's a good way to get introduced into the scientific literature. Um, it's a little easier to digest than jumping into an experimental paper. So I try to find reviews on the current uh, state of post-traumatic stress research um, and similar with addiction. Also, you know, talking to peers and mentors, um, other people in my lab, um, teachers, uh, even just like YouTube videos, uh, you can find a lot of information on lectures or people explaining these things. So there's a lot of resources out there. I also use YouTube to learn a lot. <laughs> so that's a, that's a great suggestion. Chris, what about you? Yeah, I think my favorite uh, topic to research and, and to, to teach about is uh, social neuroscience. And I, I really think that because it is so so interdisciplinary, so rich. Um, you know, it spans the gamut from like neuroscience to you know psychology, sociology, ecology, and that sort of stuff. Um, and you know how you know so many different social species kind of like interact in the same way, and like how different factors like isolation and you know group dynamics and all of those sorts of things really like impact your you know your social environment and that sort of stuff. And so um, because it's so rich, I think it's one of my favorite topics in, in neuroscience. Yeah, I'm very relevant right now with the pandemic and the, you know, isolation that sometimes we're feeling. Absolutely. Yeah. What about you, Kenha? What's your favorite topic to research or teach? I think recently it has become computational psychiatry and okay. that you basically try to look at the brain and, and inspired by the brain, you make these new artificial neural networks or these artificial systems that mimic it to not just make those programs work better, but also you can now create synthetic lesions on the on these artificial networks, which mimic uh, various psychological problems that we have, or psychological di uh, diseases or disease states or problems that we have. So we can better understand them using these artificial models. And maybe eventually we can even come up with drugs or potential um, treatment programs based on this without but actually having to do large scale uh, patient mm -hmm. or like human based intervention to by simulate it all. By synthetic lesion, what do you mean? Imagine I'm your grandma. <laughs> oh, so like, instead of having to experiment a lot with what drug might work with what physical condition, we could actually have the simulated version of the same thing. We'd have a simulated version of a brain and a simulated version of what the drug would do just to see the effects. And this would okay. obviously make it easier to do clinical trials you would have less human subjects and less required testing yeah and less cost and less time less, and less everything that sounds amazing thank you for sharing that all right we have another question this is uh, very relevant for the high school student audience what classes did you take in college and maybe we can start with kanha uh i think so i started out Again, being an engineering major, most of my classes were technical and like math based. And um, that, that was my first two years. By third and fourth year, I think that's when I really started to specialize, uh, really started to like broaden my um, field of expertise. And I looked into bio, bio classes and neuro classes, but they were all with an applied mindset that how can you apply these engineering skills or these math skills into these uh, healthcare settings or biology settings or neuro settings. So that's my journey being like. Yes. What about you, Chris? Yeah, so as I, as I mentioned before, I was a psychobiology major in college. And so um, the first couple of years uh, were kind of just like the, the standard course load for, for most like biology majors. So biology, chemistry, physics, that sort of stuff. Um, but towards the last two years of my of college, um, at the beginning, it was like a lot of like psychology courses, um, just because that was kind of what was uh, required of the majors. So like social psychology, um, sensation and perception, that sort of stuff. 
Um, and then towards the end, when I really got to like choose my electives and stuff, um, because I really did have this like passion for neuroscience, um, I was choosing more classes like, you know, behavioral neuroscience or like systems neuroscience or um, what else I'm trying to think. More neuroscience classes for sure. Neuropsychopharmacology, which is kind of like the study of, of chemicals and, and drugs on the brain. Um, yeah. What about you, Mackenzie? Yeah, similar to Chris and Kanha, kind of took the standard chemistry, biology, physics um, in the beginning uh, of my undergrad and then moved to more specific neuroscience classes. Some of my favorites were uh, the neurobiology of learning and memory, um, diseases and disorders of the nervous system. Um, I really enjoyed my neuroscience lab class. Um, we got to do some really cool experiments. Um, but the school I was at also required you to take um, English or literature, you know, humanities classes. Um, so I had some interesting um, ones of those. Some, I took a class called Infinity and Paradox. Um, I took one on bioethics. So I really enjoyed my neuroscience classes, but I also enjoyed some of those other humanities classes that I probably wouldn't have picked for myself, but ended up really enjoying. Awesome. Well, thank you for that. Let me see if there's any new questions. Yep, we have a new question from the audience. It says, what personal qualities are important to be successful in your career? Maybe I can give you a few seconds to think about that. <laughs> this is a very important question and very good question. Do you want to start, Mackenzie? Yeah, I can think of a couple of things that just come to mind right away. Um, I think one thing is, you know, perseverance and being persistent and not taking failure personally. Um, I kind of talked about that earlier, but I think in the lab especially, you'll have days when experiments don't work. You'll have days when your data just doesn't look very interesting or what you expected. Um, so I think, you know, failure happens to everyone at some point or other in the lab. Um, so I think, you know, remembering that that doesn't reflect on you as a scientist. It's nothing that you did that is, you know, saying you can't be a scientist. It's just uh, coming back the next day and thinking about it in a new way. And, trying to figure out a different way around it. Um, and then I guess, you know, the ability to work well with others. I think some of the most fun and interesting things I've worked on have been, you know, when I bounce ideas off each other, I actually worked with Nancy on a project um, back in the fall. And I think that was really exciting to hear her perspectives and be able to offer mine and kind of, you know, Science is very isolating sometimes. You work in a bubble. So when you have opportunities to work with other people, I think it's it's really meaningful and can um, can move uh, your science further. Yeah, awesome. OK, so to summarize, persevere, perseverance, and working on with teams. Yes. What, about, what do you think, Chris? Yeah, I totally agree with everything that uh, Mackenzie said. Um, I think resilience and communication are both really important factors. Um, I also think that um, stress and time management are really, really important. Um, time management because you know there's going to be you're going to have like so many different opportunities um, in science, and there's just you know I mean you really have to be organized in in how you like really tackle all of those things. Um, and so I think that's a that's a skill that um, you know will come with time for sure uh, when you're when you're working in a, in a field like STEM. Um, and stress management. I think, you know, a healthy work-life balance is, is really, really important. You know, exercising, taking time for yourself, listening to your body. Um, you know, it's, I, I think it's more um, disadvantageous when you're just constantly working, 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 and you like burn out because like in, in the long run, um, that's just going to, you know, lead to, to worse results and stuff. What do you do to de-stress, Chris, if you want to share with us? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I hang out with friends uh, within, you know, my COVID bubble. Um, I, you know, go to the beach. Uh, sometimes I go surfing. Um, you know, sometimes we do bonfires and that sort of stuff. Um, yeah, really getting that social support, I think, is, is really important. Exercising, totally. Awesome. Thank you for that. What about you, Kanha? What do you I think, think Chris. do you think that mm -hmm. are important for this success in this career? I think both Chris and Mackenzie made excellent points and mostly I would echo them. If I was to add something, I would say that in, in research, what I've experienced is that you don't get to like have very, you don't get major achievements or breakthroughs every day. It's more of a long game. You will see something amazing in maybe two or three months after a lot of hard work. And as you've heard, after you experience a lot of failures, so you should develop, you should learn to develop a sense of like a self-validation system that you get on a day-to-day -day basis to feel more satisfied with yourself. Because as 
it's a marathon, it's not a sprint. Yeah. And it will certainly yield results if you put in the hard work. So I think yeah. that's what I had to learn during grad school because yeah, I, I know how to just feel more satisfied and content on a weekly basis. Yeah, indeed, like there'll be failure many, many times before you succeed very likely. So that's just inherent to research. Um, so resilience, managing stress, uh, time management, knowing how to communicate all of these are important for, for this career. So our next question is a little bit more technical. It says, what specific regions of the brain are you studying? What do we know about these regions? And what are you trying to figure out? <laughs> so maybe we can start with Kanha. Do you feel comfortable starting? Uh, I think so. the region that I'm working with is the prefrontal cortex. Nancy actually is an expert on that. So I think it would be better if she explained the, what we know about PSD more because she has been my guide throughout the process. Okay. I, can, I, can, I can participate in this question, yeah. So we know that the prefrontal cortex is super important for, for decision making and for planning and guiding our behavior. So I, that would be the, what we know about it. So what are you trying to figure out, Kanha? I'm trying to see that basically, in, again, in current artificial intelligence systems, we can obviously make them bigger and bigger and in order to make them perform more complicated tasks. But that's not how the brain does it. The human brain does not grow over the years beyond let's find an adult, for example. It stays the same and yet you're able to do and learn millions of tasks across your lifetime. So by looking at the PFC, we're trying to see how we can make the same systems more flexible in terms of efficiency, in terms of learning more tasks, and be basically be able to do them well at, at a low cost. So you're basically trying to imitate the prefrontal cortex in your artificial intelligence to make the artificial, intern, the artificial networks more like the prefrontal cortex. So that's a very mm -hmm. unique project. What about you, Chris? Yeah, a couple different regions. Um, most recently, prefrontal cortex for the the reasons that that you and uh, and Kanha both explained. Um, really involved in like dynamic, you know, social behaviors and that sort of stuff. Um, another brain region that you know our lab has studied that I'm very very interested in are these um, there are these dopamine neurons, so neurons that produce dopamine um, in a brain region called the dorsal raphid nucleus. Um, and there's not very much that's actually known about these um, these neurons. It's actually a pretty um, new, um, you know, like population of cells uh, that's that's being investigated at the moment in the field. Um, but what we have is that these neurons seem to really reflect um, this, you know, like loneliness-like state, or this, um, you know, th there are some changes that occur after you know a degree of social isolation. And so I'm really interested in, in social isolation. How does you know social isolation on an acute and on a, a chronic level um, change our like social behaviors, and how are those changes um, encoded um, in you know our brain, especially in the medial prefrontal cortex, and how might you know the connections between these regions uh, be important? What does encoded mean? Yeah. So essentially, how does um, the way that our um, our neurons like fire the activity of these neurons um, change with, uh, with these sorts of things. So when I say encoded, I mean the the activity of, of these neurons essentially. Okay, so how does the activity of the neurons change with social isolation? Essentially, yes, yeah. Okay, awesome. What about you, McKinsey? Uh, yeah, so I also work in the prefrontal cortex. Um, I've done a couple of different uh, projects with it. Um, some social behavior, um, like Chris mentioned and Kanha mentioned, and then I'm also currently looking at um, ethanol intake and how the brain encodes or represents um, in the medial prefrontal cortex, how uh, that region specifically um, responds to a mouse when it starts drinking ethanol, um, how a mouse that drinks a lot of ethanol versus not a lot of ethanol, how those, um, the medial prefrontal cortex fires differently for those uh, different phenotypes. Um, and then we're also looking at the basal lateral amygdala. Um, it's a very specific region of the amygdala, which is really involved in fear and motivation. Um, and again, kind of looking at how social isolation or ethanol um, and stress uh, 
are represented um, in the amygdala. Cool. And in case in case some some people might not heard that word ethanol, it's basically alcohol. So McKinsey's studying how does the brain change and how does these prefrontal cortex and amygdala change and are involved in the alcohol consumption, which is a very important question when it comes to like relevance to drug addiction and understanding what alcohol does to our body. Well, thank you for that. We're certainly in the prefrontal cortex club in this panel. Our next question says, how has your research impacted your actions or views on everyday life? This is a really interesting question. Mackenzie, do you have something in mind? Yeah, so I don't know if it's necessarily everyday life, but I think something that research has impacted on kind of how I view the world is um, how we think about mental health treatment and certain disorders, I think addiction specifically. Um, I think, you know, in the past, a lot of people have felt a stigma around mental health or people saying you're weak if you have mental health problems. But I think my research has really shown, you know, that's not the case. There is a biological explanation for why people feel a certain way, why they develop addictions, um, why they develop depression or post-traumatic stress disorder. And, you know, it's not just someone having like their own isolated issue. There really is something going on in our brains that are causing that. Um, and I think being able to realize that in everyday life has um, helped me, you know, start to advocate for mental health and the importance of taking care of that and how it's not something to be ashamed of. And, you know, we should all be talking about it more and, and treating it more like physical um, injuries too. Yeah. Yeah. They are physical of the brain. I, I agree with you that there it's perhaps having knowledge of neuroscience helps destigmatize mental illness, which is a very important thing to do for the well-being of everybody, you know, for the well-being of all, everyone in society. Um, so mental mental um, health awareness is super important. Chris, what about you? 100% um, what Max said, um, what Mackenzie said. Um, yeah, I mean, really, I think, uh, you know, just, just exposure to, to the field um, has really, like, made me more empathetic to, to people who, you know, suffer from neuropsychiatric disorders, especially, like, addiction, especially, you know, depression, anxiety, and so on. Um, really understanding that there's kind of, like, this biological substrate that there, you know, changes in, you know, the way that our neurons fire, changes in, you know, the, the chemicals that are released in our brain really does like, you know, it, it grounds um, kind of like the stigma that's associated with these uh, these disorders. And so 100% um, agree with, with Mackenzie. What do you think, Kanha? I, th I think definitely um, I agree with both sets of comments that were made about this question. I think I could maybe comment on the other side of the same problem that, uh, so I, I've, I've had, I've been in therapy for some time and I think but when I first started, I was always a little skeptical about it, about well, how it could help you and affect you. But when I learned about plasticity of neurons and how literally the experiences you have and the stimuli that you get from the environment, they can change the wirings of your brain, the connections between different neurons. And that's how it can act. That's how, for example, behavioral therapy can actually help you. That made me believe in the system so much more. And like that actually helped me uh, intellectually understand what's happening. And I think that helped me get better even in faster. Right. And that's, that's an amazing uh, experience, you know, like going from like not really understanding how this is supposed to help you to suddenly having this revelation of like, oh, this is how it works. And then maybe knowing that makes you feel better about it. And then there's this loop of like improvement that's possible. Awesome. It's exactly like if you have fever and you take a fever medication, we know it works because of the effects. So exactly, exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. So that's one important thing that, you know, despite any there's a there's a lot of things that can trigger, you know, our stress and like trigger mental illness, but we have the ability, our brain is plastic. So we have the ability of restoring um, through, you know, of course, like there's therapy, but there's, we're also working on, that's what, what one of, what, one of the things that motivates us, right? Like to do these basic neuroscience researches for one day to improve the therapies, the pharmacotherapies or other types of therapies that might come in the future. All right. Our next question says, 
how do you tell if the hypothesis of an experiment is wrong or if an error occurred in the experiment that might have altered the results? Um, so this is a question that is more geared to the experimentalists in the room. So I'm going to let Chris and Mackenzie talk about this because Kanha does simulation. So if you want to participate, Kanha, go for it. But if you want to skip it, you can skip it. <laughs> I think they would be better geared towards answering this question. So. Chris, do you want to start? Sure, I can. I can start. Um, I think this is such a good question. Um, it is really, really tough. Um, you know, and, and I think when you're designing experiments, um, you usually don't have like one hypothesis. You know, you usually have like multiple hypotheses of of what's going on. And what you're testing for is, you know, what you know, like what what hypothesis does the results fit into into better. And so, you know, it's, it's always kind of hard to tell with like 100% certainty, um, but you definitely let, I think the data kind of like guide you in that. Um, as far as, you know, um, how do you know if like an error occurred? That's always something that's always in the back of my mind, you know, it's like, oh, did I like forget to, I don't know, did I give like the wrong drug or something? Um, did I do, I don't know, something incorrectly? Um, taking good notes is, is very important, I've learned, um, yeah. Replication too helps with that, right? Absolutely. Like yep, replicate. multiple times. And yeah. also control groups help with that too, right? So yes. say that there was like an error that occur across the board, you will see the consequence in both the control group and the experimental group. But this is this is indeed a great question because we have that's why it takes so long to do an experiment because there's so many technical hurdles that we have to overcome and that's where the failure comes. Um, what do you think, Mackenzie? Yeah, I echo everything you said. I was going to say replication. You know, if you do something one time, you could get a result from a random error. But if you see the same result three or four times across different groups, then you can have a lot more confidence that, that you're seeing a real result. Um, I'd also say kind of similar to what I said earlier of talking to other people, um, you know, one time I had an issue with my data where I thought I just didn't, there was nothing interesting um, and I didn't have a result. And then I talked to uh, one of my colleagues and we figured out if we looked at our data in a little bit of a different way, we actually saw exactly what we expected or we saw similar to what we expected, but kind of with a different twist on it. So I'd also echo, you know, collaboration, working with people, talking to other people saying, did you get a similar issue? Because um, maybe other people are having the same thing and it's an easy fix. So. Um, I agree with everything they said and also just talking to other people in your lab and the people you're working with. Yeah, that's where the teamwork comes in handy, right? Like it's, you don't have to solve the issue alone. You just have to talk to others and you might be able to solve it without spending weeks on it. So this next question that we have is pretty interesting and different and perhaps fun. It says, have you had an opportunity to study abroad or travel for this for your career? So McKinsey, do you want to start? Yeah, um, I was supposed to be able to travel to Maine um, last summer to go to a conference, um, but unfortunately that was canceled due to the pandemic. Um, the only other time that I really traveled abroad for something science related was actually not for neuroscience. I had an opportunity to go to Cyprus, which is a small island in the Mediterranean, um, for a month to do an archaeology dig. Um, so I would also encourage to, you know, look at opportunities in other fields to go abroad because it was a great experience and, uh, I'm really glad I did it, even though it was not neuroscience. Wow. That's amazing. What an amazing experience. Fun fact. You can use it <laughs> as a fun fact. Chris, what about you? Have you done any traveling that related to your career? I have. Yeah. Um, definitely for conferences. Um, I actually had this like really cool opportunity, um, you know, between between college and when I started graduate school, where I was teaching these workshops to to build these uh, microscopes, and I actually had the opportunity to uh, travel to New Zealand because they actually invited us to uh, to um, teach a workshop to to build these uh, little microscopes. So that was actually really fun. Um, we turned it into like a half vacation, half you know, workshop teaching uh, session, but. That was really, really cool. I think that's like one of the perks of, uh, of science actually is that you get to, to travel like all over the world. Yeah, 
So for those high school students that hear the word conference and you're not so sure what that means, in the context of scientific research, a conference is this major event where scientists come and gather and, and share their results. So they're extremely important for the scientific process. So we all, as scientists, have to attend conferences. Kanha, what about you? Have you done any traveling or studying abroad for this career? Uh, well, I mean, I'm from India, so technically what I'm doing is studying abroad. But also, like, even before this, uh, in my undergrad, in my third year, I had the opportunity to um, I talk to a professor in ETH Zurich in Switzerland, and he gave me uh, a summer internship offer. But due to certain reasons, I wasn't able to go. But he was still nice enough to let me work on the project remotely. I'm really glad I did because that was my first introduction to machine learning. And that's literally driven, like, changed my career trajectory entirely and that's why i'm here today so I'm, I'm just glad i took whatever opportunities came and like i feel like you get such a diverse set of uh point of views when you're looking outside your bubble even even, even your country can be a bubble and i think it's just nice to have that point of view what a nice anecdote because you know like now this past year and this current year a lot of the opportunities are remote so you experienced many years ago not being able to go to the place in person and still it, it was a career changing opportunity. So for those high school students in the audience, like, yeah, those remote opportunities can be career changing. So that's, that's great. Thank you for sharing that, Kanha. Okay, our next question says, what was the first step you took once you graduated high school? How did you know it was right for you? Like that step was right for you, Kanha. That is a very good question. I don't think, I think the most more, more important thing is to be in a good position to have like your options lined up and like look at the pros and cons of each. And at the end, once you have them like shortlisted to the last few, then there is no more bad, there are no more bad options. And I feel like, especially when you're at the high school stage, it is very hard to be sure of like what you, the, whether the, the decision you're making is right for you or not. And I, I feel that every decision, all if I look at all my peers from high school and where they've been, all their decisions have been right in the long term. I think it's more about how you shape your decision than what decision you make. And the cool thing is that the obviously wrong decisions are obviously wrong. So <laughs> that helps. So. Um what was your first decision was it the decision to go to the specific college that you got accepted mm -hmm. i think my my decision was to just like stick to engineering and the system again in india is slightly different from the us you have a centralized examination for all engineering schools so i just appeared for that i just went with the flow and then i carved out i think my future during my undergrad so it was more mm -hmm. in the process of then right before for me yeah yeah and always like people can change majors so you know don't worry too much about that first decision perhaps know that it's not even it's reversible if needed <laughs> chris what was your experience uh, what was your experience uh with that first step once you graduated high school yeah definitely um i think i mean i mean similar i guess to to, to kana is was you know figuring out like what i wanted to do um i kind of like I guess I intended to go to medical school. I, I really wanted to at the, at the at the moment, and I think I kind of um, that was like really the only like option that I, I kind of like set myself up for. Um, and so I actually I, I absolutely agree with Kanha that you know leaving opportunities, leaving options open is is so important because you just never know what's gonna what's gonna happen, how life is gonna guide you to you know different um, you know career options and that sort of stuff. Um, yeah. Yeah. I bet if we talked to you, you know, when you were starting, you would have said, I'm, I'm doing this because I'm going to med school. But then the same experience was able to give you meaningful, you know, uh, opportunities for a, a, an alternative career path, which you're on now. So absolutely. Yeah. I started doing research actually when I was in college because um, I just figured that that's like what, you know, medical students or like, you know, pre-med students have to do to, to go to medical school. And when I started doing research, I like loved it. And that's you know, kind of what um, helped me make my decision to go to graduate school instead. Interesting, awesome. What about for you, Mackenzie? 
Uh, yeah, I think a little bit different from Kanha and Chris. The first thing I did right after graduating high school was relax and take some time off. Graduating high school is a huge achievement and you don't want to burn out, kind of like we touched on earlier. So first thing you should do is relax and congratulate yourself on all the hard work you put in for four long years. Um, and then after that, I think similar, just kind of started looking at some options. Uh, I looked at research labs that were doing some things I thought I was going to be interested in, um, similar to Chris, and research was the highlight of my college career. Uh, so I, you know, encourage everyone to to look into some of those opportunities that you can take and don't limit yourself, try new things, you know, kind of similar to what they said, just, you know, look at all the options you can take advantage of. Great, great, great advice. And speaking of advice, our final question for the panel. The question says, what is one piece of advice you have for high school students that aren't sure what type of stuff they want to go into? What do you think? Um, I think the best way to kind of learn what you want to do, and I've done this myself, is to talk to people doing things you might be interested in. If you think you're interested in neuroscience, talk to a neuroscientist. If you think you're interested in physics, find a senior or junior who's doing physics and just see what they like and what their experiences have been like. Excellent advice. What about you, Chris? Do you have anything to add? Yeah, totally. Absolutely what, what uh, Mackenzie said. Um, I would say also, you know, college is really fun because you get to choose like from so many different classes. So, you know, feel free to explore a little bit, um, kind of like push the bounds a little bit and see what really interests you. With the classes, you mean? Yes. Yeah. Okay. What, are, what do you think, Anha? I, I think in high school, you should, there's two aspects to my answer here. First is that if you're in high school, you should look at what you would be want to be doing down, like 10 years down the line, but like not super specific, more pie in the sky. What dreams you have? How would you would how would you want to change the world? And then like write them down maybe. And the second aspect would be as Max said, talk to the people who are not doing it to learn about what their journey is and what actually they ended up doing and how they are changing the world in that specific way. So you can both have your dreams and keep them grounded at the same time. So to achieve realistic dreams, but also always dream. Wow. Wow. Incredible advice. Thank you guys. This was uh, this was great advice. <laughs> awesome. It is wonderful to have had you all for our panel. Thanks so much for giving of your time and your talents and sharing a little bit about neurobiology, illuminating aspects of how they carry over into our everyday life. I know I'm walking away with a little more hope thanks to hearing about the plasticity of neurons and the power of teamwork that I think we've all seen what science is able to accomplish in a really short time over this pandemic. And it's just awesome to hear of the work that's being done here at SALT. Thank you for giving of your time. And thank you as well to our audience for participating, for submitting your questions. We couldn't have done it without you and your participation. We look forward to hearing from you on our other virtual lab tours and panel discussions that'll be happening this week. Thank you so much for attending. And we'll see you on the next virtual live panel, possibly this afternoon, if you're catching us at 2 p.m. Thanks friends for joining. Have a great rest of your afternoon.